So welcome back to phylogenetics, back to basics. Now we're going to talk about building trees uh, based on distance data. So you might be wondering why build trees? The main reason is that the number of possible trees gets so large so fast that we can't check them all. We can't search them all. And here are some sort of comparable numbers, just for some relatively modest numbers of taxa, that's number of species. Um, and show and it shows the very rapid growth in the number of possible trees. Um, with say 10 taxa, there's just that 34 and a half million trees. Um, 48 taxa, that's up to about the number of particles in the universe. And 136 taxa, which is the number of tree, uh, the number of taxa in the original out of Africa data, um, uh, is well more than the number of places in the universe measured in the smallest possible physical distance, the Planck distance. I mean, it's it's ridiculous that free space in that way is worse than real space, worse than space space. Um, this is a picture of a couple of galaxies colliding. Um, it won't get that bad for us though. So we have to build trees. Um, why should it work? Uh, well, if the sequence data that correspond to our species are well behaved, then we can confidently say that, for example, species that are similar to each other are probably closely related to each other. And that's the basis by which we say that two species will be um, perhaps sister taxa, uh, be each other's closest relatives in a group um, in comparison with the rest. The molecular sequences are evolving at a nice steady rate. That's the molecular clock hypothesis. And if there isn't too little or too much evolution, so not enough information or just um, effectively looking random, then that can be good enough. And then we can confidently build a whole tree. Now, trees based on distances uh, require that we have some sense of what a distance means on a tree. So that's what I'm going to talk about briefly now. The most natural way to infer distances from trees is by the path lengths. Uh, that is the sum of the branch lengths between any two nodes in the tree. So if the species are two tips in the tree, you add the branch lengths on the unique path that joins them. Because it's a tree, we know there's a unique path. There's no choice involved. And that's a very well-defined way to get distances between the nodes. Distances that we make in that way are called patristic distances. No clue why. I could look it up. So let's think about patristic distances on a particular tree. Uh, we'll just suppose that this is the true tree. And we might be trying to infer that true tree based on the distances that we see between the tips. Uh, imagine for a moment that we don't know what the branches are above the tips. Uh, we don't know where node A, B, C, or the root are. We're trying to infer that based on the distances between the tips. But uh, initially, we'll construct distances that are the patristic distances between each pair of leaves and put those into a distance matrix. And then we try and recover this tree from that distance matrix. And the patristic distances here are going to go into that distance matrix. For example, the distance between F and G is going to be the sum of the path lengths, uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.025, giving you 0 0.045. Similarly, the distance between G and H gives me 0 0.07, if I've added those up correctly. And the distance between E and F, 0 0.085, if I've added those up correctly. And all of those distances are going to go into a distance matrix. So a set of distances that match the patristic distances of some tree is called tree-like. So if those distances are tree-like, then most tree construction methods will work. There's one that doesn't work under those circumstances, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. We're going to get more constrained the most constrained we can possibly be and say in fact that we're going to have not only distances that are tree-like but distances that have the same root to tip distance for every tip 
And those sorts of distances are called ultrametric. Uh, the distances on this tree are ultrametric. You can add up the distance from D to the root, D to the root, and so on. And it should all be, I think, 0 0.05. So let's suppose that we have this initial tree and we're going to reconstruct it from its distance matrix. So um, there's a couple more terms to know. The maximum of the root to tip distances is the height. And so the height of this tree is the same uh, as the root to tip distance for everything because it's ultrametric. And we should know that if the distances that are represented by the distances between tips are a good measure of the amount of evolutionary time that's passed, then we should expect this property. So if things are evolving according to a molecular clock, looking over roughly the same rate, we would expect distances to plot to have this property. And if they do have this property, reconstructing trees from ultrametric distances is ridiculously easy. Let's have a go. So here's my original tree again, and the distance matrix I've calculated between every pair is uh, over on the right. You'll note that it's a symmetric matrix in the sense that if I flipped it, I reflected it on that main diagonal, I'd get the same values. I've got an asterisk there that's just saying a note that this is twice the root to tip distance. Of course, that makes sense because the distance from D to F is all the way from D up to the root, and then all the way from root down to F. So it's twice the height of the tree. So another um, way of thinking about this ultrametric property is something called the three-point condition, which you may come across. And this works for rooted trees. And it says that for any three tips or any three leaves of the tree, in our case, B, E, F, G, H, any three of them, the larger of the two, sorry, the larger two of the three pairwise distances will be equal. And if your distances satisfy that, then you know your distance matrix satisfies the ultrametric property and you should be able to reconstruct the tree easily. Assuming the distances are right, of course. This is the slightly simplified version without the lower left triangle because it's symmetric, we don't really need it. And actually we don't really need that main diagonal full of zeros anyway. So you'll frequently see distance matrices just in terms of the uh, single copy of the informative bit of information. So D to E, D to F, E to F. The distance from G to E is uh, G, e, 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 G to E, G to G is there. So all the distances involving uh, G to D, G to E, G to F, and G to H essentially are uh, in the column above where I've highlighted and in the row where I've highlighted, or the G to everything else distances. Now, just a reminder, the general approach on how we build a tree is we go from our sequence alignment somehow to form a distance matrix. And then given our distance matrix, you select pairs of nodes to join forming a new node. And then we ask ourselves, well, have we finished? And if we have, then we stop. And if we haven't, then we update that distance matrix somehow, remove the nodes that we've just joined together and replace them with their, uh, with a, a new node, say Z, and then repeat the process. So this part updating the D and this part uh, selecting the two nodes uh, slightly technical, and we'll go into those in a moment. Before we get onto that part, we need to think about how distances do come from molecular sequences. And remember, we've now aligned our sequences. And having aligned sequences, which it means that we can compare each pair of sequences together under some model or some um, imagination of how differences arise, and then we can get a distance from those uh, comparisons. The simplest of those is simply the uncorrected P distance. So it's just the proportion of sites that differ between the two sequences. Very simplistic. It doesn't really have a model associated with it, but it sometimes works reasonably well. Um, the first of the actual statistical models would be the Jukes-Cantor 
or JC69, published in 1969 uh, model. And a correction using that model can take into account the changes of mul multiple character state changes going, for example, from an A to a C and then back to an A again, even though we might not observe those changes. Um, and that is a better estimate of the amount of evolution of time that would have passed between um, two sequences. In fact, between their common ancestor and the two sequences. Next model would be the Hasegawa Shinoyano, the HKY85 model, and that is more sophisticated. It has, um, uh, it allows for variation in the base frequencies or nucleotide frequencies. I've just written them here as pi A, pi C, pi G, pi T. Um, those being proportions, we could say they're, say, 25% each, or under the HKY model, they might be 20%, 30%, 30%. 20%, I can add. Um, and the model also allows for a different rate between, uh, or different transversion and transition rates. So transitions within purine pyrimidines, transversions between them. There are many other more sophisticated models. We'll just go into a little detail about these ones, and then we'll move on to the use of those uh, corrected distances in building trees. So here's the Jukes Cantor model. Very simple. It requires that the uh, base frequencies are all equal. So 25% or a proportion of 0.25. And a rate matrix for the Jukes Cantor model simply looks like um, AGCT. Um, the rate from A to G, rate from A to C, rate from A to T, they're all the same. They're just some parameter alpha. Uh, because this is a matrix, it has to have row sums equal to zero. So this asterisk is just a shorthand. So whatever amount it needs for this row sum to be equal to zero. So in this case, it would be minus three alpha. It's not really important right now. Now, under this model, the expected number of substitutions between any two sequences with a given p distance of, say, p, is by, given by this formula. So D with a hat over it to show it's an estimate is minus three quarters, the natural log of one minus four thirds of P. Um, on average, P gets closer and closer to 0.75. Uh, as it gets closer and closer to 0.75, which is essentially what happens when sequences are effectively random with respect to each other, then this quantity, one minus four over three times 0.75 is three over four, this quantity goes to zero. So the log of that number, which is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, goes off to uh, minus infinity, you multiply it by a negative number. So the effective distance goes to plus infinity. So when the p distance gets very, very large, around 0 0.74, 0 0.73 even, then these uh, distance estimates using the Duke's Cantor correction can get wildly out of hand, really very large. And you just need to be a little bit aware of that when P gets quite large. That's known as saturation. And you won't cover it very much um, further, but it's worth knowing that when the distances between um, sequences get very large, your estimate of the actual amount of evolutionary distance between them or the evolutionary time can get really, really unreliable. The next model, the HKY85 model, allows for different nucleotide frequencies. So these can vary. You still have to sum to one. So there's only three uh, degrees of freedom, if you like, three parameters that are available to vary. Once you set pi A, pi G, and pi C, then pi T is fixed because it has to sum to one. The other thing it gives you is this um, uh, transition conversion ratio um, given by Greek letter kappa here. And you can see, don't try and remember it, but this is the HKY85 um, model where kappas are occurring for the AG GA transitions and the CTTC transitions. 
and it doesn't occur for any of the other transversions, other tra substitutions which are transversion. Um, and this also allows for a correction, much the same way as the Duke's counter one does at the bottom of this slide, but it's much more complicated and I don't want to go into it right now. It takes, uh, it's much more involved trying to do that correction, but software does that for us. So ultimately then we can go from our alignment, our favorite alignment, if perhaps we fix it up a bit better than this one. Um, and from that alignment, it means we can compare every pair of sequences and perhaps apply the HKY85 correction or the JC59 correction and end up with a distance matrix. So distance from a acutus to a aeneas, um, aeneas to acutus, and so on. And once we've done that, then we can take that distance matrix and apply it to the tree building method. So let's have an example, and we'll start with ultrametric distances, which is the easiest possible case. So imagine that we have this true tree, it's an ultrametric tree, and we've got five leaves. And we don't know what the internal relationships are, the A, the B, the C. We don't know where they, uh, they are, we don't know where the root is. So here's our original distance matrix, and we can see that there's a couple of values here that are the smallest, and that's the F, G distance. So we'll choose to put F and G together, and then we need to work out what's the distance between the new node, which we're going to label C just by chance, and the rest of the nodes. And once we do that, then we'll have reduced our problem a little bit, but it'll be the same kind of problem, and then we can just iterate and repeat this process until we're done. So imagine we put our new node C in. We want to know what its distance is to the others. We'll recall for a start that the distance from F to G is given by now a path length. So it's the length of this edge or this branch from F to C and the branch from C to G. We also know that the distance between F and H is given by this blue path, which includes the branch length C to F and some other branches. And the distance from G to H is given by the branch lengths on another path this branch C to G, C to G, and some other branches. And the branches from this new node C through to node H will be the same for the two paths. And if we think about that a little bit more, then we would might realize that in fact, the length of this path from C to H is given by the formula above. Now, why is it given by the formula above? Well, if I add the path, the blue path from F to H, and I add the green path from G to H, then I will have counted the, the branches on the path from C to H twice. And I will have counted the branch from F to C and from C to G once each. Now, if I want to take off those branches, that's equal to the distance between F and G. So the red part. What's left will be two lots of all of the branch lengths from C to H. And so if I divide it by two, then I should be done. That's the distance from C to H. So then I've got to update my distance matrix. Remember, I've worked out the new distance. I'm going to put that into my um, uh, current distance matrix, update that, and then repeat the process. So here's my original distance matrix, D with a subscript zero, and F and G are going to go, going to replace by C. So anything in a column F and G goes, or a row F or G goes, and I need new entries for row and column C. That's distance from D to C, E to C, and C to H. It's just a question of applying that same formula. So we have the distance from C to D is half of distance F to G, G to D minus F G. And we can work that out, and that's 0 0.08. The next one, distance from C to E, F to E, 
e to e minus uh, f of g again. That's common in all of the um, all of these formulae. And we get 0 0.08 again, and the last one we find is 0 0.04 uh, using the equivalent formula. So now we have the smaller distance matrix, and we do the same process again. We might be joining C with H, and uh, keep going until we're done. So you can also think about this as now, well, we've reduced this problem a bit. Um, we've gone from this original tree to this tree. Assuming that our distances are patristic, they've come from this tree, then we've made our problem a bit smaller, and we know we, that we can solve this one too. We just keep going. So that's how tree building works. What is it? This is fine if the distances are ultrametric. But uh, if they are not asymmetric, then um, we might run into problems. So non-clock-like trees next. This is where we no longer guarantee ultrametric property. So imagine that we have a tree like this. This is quite a reasonable case um, where we might have some branches in the tree uh, towards the tips of very, very long, corresponding, for example, to rapid um, radiation or uh, rapid adaptation to new environments um, or whatever. Look a lot like virus trees. Suppose this is the true one uh, and then we have this distance matrix. So I've calculated the distances between every pair with this um, very short set of red branches here, 0 0.005 each. And that leads to this distance here, distance between E and H actually being the smallest one. And so if I were to use the same process that I just have, I would pick those to go together, which would be wrong because they actually aren't siblings in this tree. They're separated by um, an extra branch and a root. And so we don't want our method to be as simplistic uh, as just choosing the smallest one. So there's a method that will solve this problem. It's called neighbor joining. Um, we've got the uh, optional British, English, Australian English spelling here. Um, it's published in American Journal, so it's neighbor joining without the U. I can't bring myself to do it. So neighbor joining solves this problem by accounting for something called the net divergence. Uh, of every node from the rest. And so distances are tree-like, even if they're not ultrametric, it will still get the tree right. And this is very consequential result. It means that neighbor joining is the best heuristic um, without further adjustments. It's the best constructing method. So the formula for net divergence, uh, if I have n taxa, so it depends on the number of nodes I have available, but if it's an n by n distance matrix, for example, then the net divergence of node i, so r sub i, is 1 upon n minus 2 of the sum of all of the distances from i to anything else. So this summation is over all of the j not equal to i, and it's summing the distance from i to j. And then the adjusted distance becomes the original distance minus the net divergence of each of the taxa that we're getting the distance between. So the star of i and j is the original distance between i and j minus the net, ver net divergence of i and the net divergence of j. So let's work through one example there. I've calculated the net divergences for these based on the distance matrix. So they look a little weird, little, they're repeating decimals because n minus two here is three. I've got five tips in my distance matrix. So I'm divided by three, so I've got 0 0.6 recurring, 0 0.6 recurring, 0 0.3 recurring here. And if I apply that adjustment to the distance matrix, I get D star, which shows um, a slightly different pattern. They're all negative. That doesn't matter at all. It doesn't mean um, that anything has gone wrong. I just need to find the most negative value or values to choose for joining together to form a new taxon, a new, yes, a new clade. And I've highlighted here in purple um, 
the two minimal values. They're between D and E and between F and G. And they're not between our problem taxa was D and it was E and H. And the entry here for E and H is not the minimal, minus 0 0.078, along with a whole lot of other ones. So if I highlight what those pairs of taxa are on my original tree, which you can see, I hope, in purple here, they're D, E. So picking those together to make a new node would be fine. And F and G. And again, picking those two together to give me node C would also be fine. Once I've done that, it's the same process as I used before to update my distance matrix. I take away the, um, well, I add the distance between F and H plus G of H minus F of G, and that gives me the distance between C and H. I'm just not going to go through that now. Very straightforward. Now, in real life, of course, distances aren't um, ultrametric, and they aren't necessarily tree-like. They may be close to it, but we'll find, for the most case, that they don't quite perfectly fit tree-likeness. Uh, they don't have that property. So if you're testing your data and you find, oh my goodness, they don't find they don't fit the molecular clock, that's not necessarily a problem. Normal. Um, it's a question of if they deviate from a molecular clock in a vast way, whether your method will cope. So real data are not tree-like in general. And then as a result, we can't guarantee that the final branch lengths are going to be per, a perfect match to the um, observed distances. So the patristic distances may not match the observed distances, even the observed corrected distances using one of the methods like the Canto or a KY85. So one approach is to adjust the final branch lengths after having constructed the tree um, and adjust them to be as close as possible to the to fit the observed distances. And one criterion that we can use is called minimum evolution, ME. This minimizes the sum of squared differences between the pairwise distances in the observed distance matrix and the pairwise patristic distances on the trees. So that's just a um, quick formula for that is summing over all pairs i and j, so all pairs of taxa, the distance between i and j minus the patristic distance between i and j, that's the tree-based one, and then squared. Squaring it gives nice properties, it means all the numbers are at least zero, and so if, the, uh, if you minimize them, you get down to zero, then it's perfect fix. It's a nice property to use. Now this is a little bit basic even, and um, it has one uh, kind of obvious flaw, which is that it's treating all of those distance estimates as independent of each other. And we've just seen that they're not independent because many distances share common paths in the tree. So they're clearly not independent. And so more sophisticated methods exist to uh, account for that. And we're encouraged to read some relevant papers about that if you're interested. Um, and so here's a couple of examples now with um, the Anolis data set that we've been using in the tutorial. And this is a tree I built with the program Splits Tree, just using neighbor joining and uncorrected P distances. And it looks okay, but I'll draw your attention to a large number of very short branches near the center of the tree, really quite short, very hard to resolve those. So perhaps uncorrected P distance isn't as good at resolving those deep branches as we'd like. The next one is Duke's Cantor. And although it hasn't, hasn't changed the structure of the tree, although it's moved over a little bit, I think it hasn't changed it. Perhaps it has. Um, it's expanded some of those branches out as well. You can see that they're sort of leaving the very central part of the of the tree and getting a little bit better resolved. And that's a good reflection of the JC69 Duke's Cantor model being a little bit more biologically realistic. 
let's try the next one, HKY85. And this is making very little distance to the tree, except again, in terms of those branch lengths, it's moving some of those branches away from the middle, which is good. Um, and it means it's going to be a little bit more easy to resolve what the root of this tree is, but we will have to talk about uh, rooting this tree uh, another time because it's not obvious what the root of this tree would be from this unrooted diagram. Now, building trees is fast. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we do it. Um, but there are some limitations. And we see here that these are reasonable trees. We didn't know any better. We might be quite uh, convinced by this tree, certainly because the three different distances, distance measures give us approximately the same tree. That's um, sort of confirming uh, that that might be the right tree. So building trees is good, um, but building trees does come with some limitations. One of the reasons we do it is that it's fast. And so under some circumstances, it's sort of the only thing we can do. Um, I think the majority of trees built around the COVID-19 data set, because it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, are built with distance-based methods very quickly. Um, but distance-based methods uh, and constructing a tree from distances do have limitations. And one of the obvious ones is that it will always give you a tree. If you give it any kind of data at all, you will get a tree. You can give it driving times between towns on a map, and it will give you a tree. You could give it colors, and it will give you a tree. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, and that in a more biological framework, you could give it, for example, distances that come from genes that may have undergone duplication and loss, and they might be correct, but might not agree with each other, even though they come from the same species. And so if you were to amalgamate those two genes into giving you a distance matrix, then there's no particular reason why you would get the right tree out of that. You might get one of the gene trees or the other or something else entirely. And the distances didn't even come from one tree. So you do have to be quite careful that you give it tree-like-ish data. So distances that should have come from a single tree. There's also no information on what the next best trees might be like. So this process will always give you a tree. It will give you one tree and it won't tell you how good that particular tree is necessarily, although uh, one could quote the least squares error. And the last limitation I want to mention is that because neighbor joining is a greedy process, it's a greedy heuristic, it makes a decision about what nodes to join and then it doesn't go back and change it. It doesn't go back and adjust things if it learns later on that maybe that was a bad idea. Uh, like a greedy person in a restaurant walks down the first course and without any planning for um, dessert. It could be terrible. And uh, so without further adjustment after constructing a, a, a tree, then neighbor joining and other constructive methods will potentially be stuck with bad decisions made early on. And so it's not necessarily the case that they were going to give you the best and most accurate tree. Now, apart from speed, um, many of these different difficulties can be overcome by the application of likelihood methods. And we'll talk about those next time. We're gonna talk about maximum likelihood as a measure of inferring evolutionary trees from alignment data, not distances from the sequences themselves. Um, and until next time, thank you very much.